Yeah, my friends, was my new brother, Matt Simpson. And uh, we're going to do something a little different today. We're going to share the mic. Uh, Matt has a podcast worth the fight. I have my podcast, The Great Unlearn, for Matt's listeners. And we're going to share this podcast on both of our platforms. So we're just going to kind of dive in, give the listeners a little bit of background on each of us, however that comes out, and then we're going to just kind of jam on some things. So welcome to our show, Matt. Thank you, Cal. It's an honor to be here and great to be here in person with you in beautiful Austin, your lovely home and studio. Thank you, brother. Yeah. Uh, tell everyone where you came down from. You're down in Austin now for about a week. Is that right? Yep. Been here since last Wednesday and uh, coming in from the trauma capital of the free world, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. <laughs> is it is it really the trauma capital? Yeah. Yeah. Um, by virtue of a 2018 study that showed that Wisconsin has 10 of the top 20th uh, drunkest cities in America. And uh, we're uh, near the top in COVID, uh, near the top in racial inequality, and um, uh, one of the most segregated countries or segregated cities in our country. Really? So it's, it's heavy. Yeah, I just started hosting the Milwaukee Psychedelic Society meetings, and it seems fitting that I'm uh, bringing a progressive message to the belly of the beast. Yeah. And what's that like? And, you know, I was going to ask you before we got on, but like, um, you know, both you and I are, are, very interested in psychedelic medicine and the benefits of it. Um, you know, aside from what maybe we experienced in our younger years at concerts with mushrooms, mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, we we, we both have had profound experiences in our own healing and just understanding, um, and, you know, understanding, I guess, on some level that we don't know a lot of what we thought we knew. Um, Absolutely. So what's it like, what's the community like? up in Milwaukee, because I'll just speak for Austin, as you know, like yeah, this is a very open and interested community when it comes to things that are, let's call it on the cutting edge of like life. Like let's try to figure shit out. It's very progressive in that sense. And so I feel super supported anywhere I turn, there are people that are interested in asking questions. So what's it like for you? Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm sensing that vibe here in Austin. That's what's very attractive. Um, that's one of the reasons why I'm down here. Uh, nearly everybody that's influenced my path in, in uh, such a profound manner uh, has have moved down here in the last 10, 10, 15 years. Who are some of those people, just out of curiosity? Uh, Tim Ferriss, Joe Rogan, Jamie Wheel, um, <laughs> you. You know, I, I'm inspired by your work. Thank and, you. and um, uh, you know, Hallie, our, our mutual friend, Hallie Rose. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's, there's many, many more that live here. Preston smiles. Uh, yeah. I've been keeping an eye on him for years. And, uh, I was blown away by that, uh, very brave, uh, podcast that you did. And, and, uh, I was really, you know, admire the way that you push that edge. Uh, not many people are willing to go there. Yeah. He's beautiful. Um, and it's amazing to have him here in Austin. He recently moved here and we've gotten together a few times, but, um, really looking forward to connecting with him and his wife and his family on a much deeper level. So yeah, yeah, yeah. You got, there's a lot of people down here. A lot. Absolutely. And, uh, to your, to your question, um, you know, Milwaukee is, um, after spending time most of the last 17 years in Chicago, uh, more progressive and, uh, six months last year out in Los Angeles, getting my book off the ground, uh, being, being in Milwaukee, there's, a, you know, I, I, I feel and sense a lot of constriction, a lot of fear and, um, you know, it's truly a, a sacred honor to be in this position, uh, to be able to hold the space and, and, uh, let people know, um, you know, we're sharing best practices around psychedelic integration. Uh, that's really my kind of my lane is, mm. is, uh, you know, psychedelics for trauma and, uh, the best ways to maximize these, uh, plant medicine healing journeys to be the best versions of yourself, uh, to be fit for service so yeah. we can, uh, love our brothers and sisters at a higher capacity and, I love the natural world at a better, higher capacity as well. Yeah. And I think you bring up a, a super interesting point that, that unfortunately is missed on a lot of people who are, um, they're curious about this and they're like, well, okay, so I just get like a bunch of mushrooms and I blast off and then I'm good. Right. I see what I need to see. And, and, and as we know, that's not it. Like that's part of it. Mm -hmm. And, um, the way you do that is also a very important part of it. But as what I think you're referring to here is there's, 
like that moment where you actually have the experience is only a part of the experience. It's what leads up to it. It's what is after with the integration. I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about what, because you've, you've had a lot yeah. more experience in like really diving deep into this stuff. I'd love to have you share that. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, the, you know, I, I look at integration and that peak reset psychedelic experience as it's the chicken and the egg as to which one is more important. And, um, you know, we have these profound healing experiences, but if we're not integrating them, what's the point? We're going to have the same experiences over and over. So there has to be uh, work done in between the lines, in between our peak experiences. And uh, that's been the, my major obstacle. And uh, that was my big challenge after traveling for 18 months with a backpack and doing loads of psychedelics in 20. 15, 16, and 17 was like, how the heck do I integrate this, these, these teachings? How do I integrate this wisdom? How do I integrate this joy and this bliss and this ecstasy that I feel within? How do I integrate this in, in service to uh, the, 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 the community that raised me? And how do I give it back? How do I pay it forward? How do I help people that are, are struggling and stuck in the same darkness that I was? And, um, and that is what uh, ultimately led to a 308-page you know, book. It is a, um, it, it's a guidebook for those that are looking to get the most out of this healing experience. And, um, yeah, you know, I share all sorts of different uh, integration strategies and, and ways to, to again, extract the, I, I believe that these, when we have these peak experiences there, uh, you know, I love, uh, Jason Silva. He, he, he had said, um, this, this is his term, um, inverse PTSD, this idea that, the just how we're healing from emotions and memories in our nervous system that come up when we're, you know, in an ayahuasca ceremony or in a, um, you know, a mushroom journey, um, just as like we're healing from that, uh, these, these ecstatic moments of ecstasy and bliss and rapture, they're in our nervous system too. And, and we can, uh, through contemplative practices, through meditation, through breath work, um, through cacao, I, I believe is an integration strategy, uh, through microdosing psychedelics, um, you know, these are, are uh, through fasting. Fasting is, is, is such a huge um, way to integrate these, these peak experiences and, and to um, extract that data, um, those insights that we can, uh, that we can get post ceremony and, um, you know, have that clarity and that insight and point that in the direction of, of being the best versions of ourselves and, and serving again, our brothers and sisters in the natural world. Shit, you just packed a lot in there. Okay, so I'm gonna try. I'm gonna do my best to unpack it. It's the cacao, so we, we, it's the, cacao. We've got the cacao for sure. <laughs> but I also want to talk about your book, and I want to talk about microdosing um, as well, because I know a lot of my listeners are curious about it. I've mentioned it from time to time. Actually, let's start with the cacao. We're gonna move on, and then I want to want to talk about your book. Yeah, yeah, we're having this um, raw organic ceremonial cacao uh, that I believe to be an integration tool and strategy. Uh, it is a uh, powerful plant medicine um, that uh, what separates it from coffee, I mean, it drinks kind of like coffee, uh, is, is that it has the uh, neurotransmitter uh, anandamide, which we'll also find in uh, THC, sativa. So uh, anandamide is tied to lateral thinking, outside the box thinking, um, connecting disparate ideas. And um, for me, it's been my favorite, most reliable go-to way to get into a flow state. And, um, yeah, it's beautiful and it's loaded with magnesium. It's a, uh, natural aphrodisiac. And, uh, like I was telling you earlier, it's, I, I believe it's also something that can elevate our uh, physical body and, and our workouts. Um, but I do, do, um, uh, call it an integration strategy because we're, uh, we're not disassociated uh, from our bodies like a psychedelic experience might have us. Mm. So we're very local. Uh, the insights are very local we're in our body. And, um, and I think that, that this is a uh, practice that can elevate, uh, massively elevate our journaling. And, um, you know, so much that I kept the journaling going and ended up writing a book. Dude, yeah. And, and you had shared something with me uh, as you were preparing it said, Hey, that's the, I got the water over 200. You're like, yeah, this look I'm like, okay, that, that's too hot. Like, yeah, you said over 175 degrees, something happens with the cacao. Yeah. At, at 175, um, or over 175, the cacao, it, it, it's no longer raw. 
and then you lose the medicinal value, a good portion of the medicinal value. And surely there's, there's still value there, but um, that's, that's the, you know, kind of the reason why the chocolate that you're going to get at the store that's processed, uh, it's, you know, the medicine's been cooked out of it. And, um, but when we keep the, um, you know, it's been cooked, toasted, and that's where, where you get this lovely flavor, um, but, but not to the point where it's, uh, they're cooking out in that, um, the medicinal value. And, and uh, as a raw plant medicine, it still has that, um, that plant spirit that, that we can uh, utilize and, and with intention. Uh, can can level up um, our work and our health. And uh, remind me, so the listeners know where uh, where they can source, like where you get yours, and why you've chosen this particular spot. Yeah, the um, this cacao comes from uh, Soul Lift Cacao, and um, I came across uh, the owner of Soul Lift, uh, Nick Medar, on my travels, and um, you know. He's a great guy doing great work. And I've had him on my podcast and, uh, you know, he's, he's in this for the right reasons and, and, and he's got a legal, a legal, uh, food business in California and, and he's got a great product and been turning my friends and family on to it for years. And, and, um, it's a, it's an absolute treat. And then quite simply, right. Like give, can you give people like the, this is how it's prepared. And I'll say this, the, there was a lot more water in there than I thought, so it was great for me to, and Peyton, my wife was, was here as you were preparing it. She's, I'm very much like her. Don't, don't tell me how to do it. Like show me so I can actually see it. And so just watching you prepare it was like, oh, now to be fair, you, I think to, by your own uh, estimation, you probably poured a little too much water in, Perhaps, but, yeah. but you know, of a, of the cup, you know, it was, um, you know, 80% filled with water. And so what else in, in explain, I'd love for you to explain what else was in the preparation. Yeah. Just, uh, you know, it's, it's, we're prepping it almost like a tea, you know, we have the hot water and, and, uh, we take a, a, a few tablespoons and, and put the hot water in a little dash of vanilla and a little of that, uh, organic, uh, say on, uh, say on cinnamon is, is something, uh, we put some of the, the MCT oil, uh, the bulletproof MCT oil to get a little yeah. extra kick. So if we, uh, we talk a little fast here on the podcast, you'll know why. Yeah, bear with us. Go, go to half <laughs> yes. speed. Yes. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, you know, it's an absolute treat and, uh, easy to prepare. And, and, uh, this is just one way to prepare it and it drinks like coffee and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's bitter. Um, but, uh, it's an acquired taste that, that uh, you know, in time, you know, that you, you can, glean the, the nuances and the subtleties of the different, different varieties and brands. And, and it's, uh, it's quite nice. And you were saying it's, it's a great thing. And again, people wanting something at night when they're like, oh, I kind of want a cup of coffee. I want something, a little boost, you know, what they generally go, there aren't a lot of options, right? So people go to coffee, maybe they'll drink decaf because they just wanted something hot, but you were explaining to me the benefits of having this at nighttime. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's not something that I, um, necessarily will have at night, but I've known people that will have it and, and it doesn't disrupt their sleep. Um, I like to, to have it kind of, uh, early afternoon and, uh, I think got that, um, and, or that's aligned with, with Aubrey's, uh, own the day on your life. You know, mm -hmm. it's just, this is something that, you know, is, is, uh, a, a powerful tool that can, uh, elevate our, our afternoons and, and, um, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful plant medicine. It's uh, great to share with you here and great to be here, here with you. Yeah, likewise, brother. Yeah, and I think there's, you were saying there's a lot of magnesium in there. So I think that might help with people's sleep. But I, I think to your point, the, the one of the things that's most interesting to me is this heart opening, you know, quality that it has. And so I'm, I'm interested to explore more into this as anybody who knows me knows that now that I've had this experience, it's time for me to go balls deep and really kind of understand it through my own experience. And so I'm grateful for you for bringing that to the. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's an amazing point. And, and it warms my heart to hear that, uh, the, the cathartic value of this, um, I mean, it's like chocolate. It gives us all that kind of that gooey feeling, that warm feeling. And, um, and, and yeah, you know, some of the cathartic releases that I've had with this and just being truly in the present moment where you're just grateful for everything. 
um, is, is, is profound. It's grace. It's really a, 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 um, you know, after again, traveling the world for 18 months and doing almost all the psychedelics, uh, to have this be my favorite, most revered, most reliable plant medicine that, um, brings so much joy uh, to my heart and, and, uh, clarity to my work. And are you doing it on a daily basis? Um, probably three, three times a week, three times a week, times a week. And, and, uh, you know, when it's, uh, yeah, sometimes, sometimes it's good to take a day or two off and, yeah. and, uh, but, but yeah, there's going to be a, a high frequency as well. And then while we're on the, how many days a week type of conversation, let's talk a little bit about microdosing and what your experience has been. Yeah, I'd love to share, love to share about this. This is, um, something that I think is, uh, going to be integral, uh, to the, uh, successful, uh, you know, this, this surge of the psychedelic Renaissance and this idea, um, not necessarily that people are pulling away from peak experiences. It's just that there's, um, understanding the risk profile. And, um, if you can get a similar benefit to the peak experience, but with, with a lot less variability, um, you know, uh, it, the, the microdosing has been something that has been, uh, profound for me. And, um, you know, the, uh, Paul Stamets is, uh, psilocybin, niacin, lion's mane stack, mm-hmm. um, is, is something that I've, I've done off and on, uh, in 2019 and 2020. And it's, uh, excuse me, it, it, uh, it's powerful. And, and his claim, you know, you got the stoned ape theory over here. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm looking at that beautiful piece of art that you have and, and Paul Stamets, our, our planet's, uh, most, uh, revered, um, mycologist, uh, believes that his stack, this, uh, lion's mane, psilocybin, niacin stack is going to be as important to, uh, the evolution of our species as the stoned ape theory. Um, and could you unpack the stoned ape theory? And it's probably not surprising to you that I gifted that same, um, beautiful piece of art to Kyle Kingsbury mm. as a show of gratitude for him taking me through my first psilocybin journey. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Um, the, the stoned ape theory is, is a, um, a theory that is, um, you know, that Joe Rogan and, and there's some other big names that are really proponents of it and, and, and made it. Did it originally with Terrence McKenna? It, it, yeah, it may have been Terrence McKenna. Yes. Um, but the idea is that our hominid ancestors, um, separated themselves from the other five or six great apes that were alive, um, at that time, I don't know, 40,000 years ago, maybe longer. Um, and, uh, they made this leap in, uh, in consciousness by, um, hunting these animals and, and, and picking up the, uh, mushrooms, the psilocybin mushrooms that were growing on the poop of the animals that they were following. It sounds a little crazy when you say it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but picking up these, these, um, these mushrooms and nibbling on them and eating them. And, uh, and that is, is, um, purported to, or uh, the anthro- anthropologists think that it may, might have, um, resulted in the acceleration of the prefrontal cortex and, um, this, this self-awareness, uh, you know, our latest, um, neuronal adaptation, um, that, uh, that separate us and, and have made us the, um, the lone great ape, uh, on the planet. <laughs> self-awareness. There are some people who have none of that. So we need to get this stuff out. These, yes. these are important conversations. People mm-hmm. think about all those friends, you know, that have no self-awareness, like this is for them potentially. Absolutely. Not a doctor, but just anecdotally from my own experience, I'll just speak from that, that it has, it creates a ton of self-awareness, but in a beautiful container where you're able to receive the information, you know, without shame, without guilt, without judgment, um, which I think is very different from our current or normal waking state. And the, the idea I would say is be able to take that experience in the medicine it kind of gives you, you know, to use the, the, the kind of working out theme, like it gives you a few reps of what it feels like to not have that shame associated. And then if you can, in our kind of more, you know, our waking reality, our everyday life, if we can start to experience the, the letting go of that, um, all that judgment, 
uh, we start to realize that we we are keeping ourselves in these prisons, mm. right? These prisons of the mind and the heart. I think for a lot of men in particular, there's there's that kind of armoring of the heart for for a number of reasons, which I'm sure we'll get into later. Too. But yeah, I love for me, I've loved the um, going into the experience. Um, which, you know, like it's for, for me, each time I, you know, kind of step to the altar to, to go into the experience, I'm nervous. As you should be. Yeah. You know, it's like, I know that most likely I'm going to experience some sort of death that, um, though is not the death in the sense that most of us know it is very real when it's happening. And so people would be like, well, why the fuck would you do that? Well, because there's a beauty in letting go of that and surrendering to that. And when I haven't surrendered in the medicine, it becomes very challenging. Otherwise known as, you know, a bad trip by some people. I just say it's challenging and it's teaching me, as as you would know, time and again, let go, surrender. Like there's so much that is happening that is outside of your control. And as I try to wrap my hands around the thing, it shows me that it's not the way. And so that's a message that continues to come up for me, which is one that maybe someday I'll truly get it, but I need the constant reminder. And, and I love what you were talking about earlier, that if you don't do the integration work, you'll still get the same message. Over and over and over. And I've had that experience, you know, where it's like, fucking don't take life so seriously. Like this is all play. It doesn't mean just go dick off all the time, but like there's so much joy in this world to be had in this world. It's there waiting for you to experience it. If you could just get on that particular wavelength vibration, just in the right state. Um, And so I've, you know, again, like Part of the reason I go back into the work is I know there are some things that I'm forgetting. And it's like, okay, remember when you can try to control shit, it gets really hairy. Let go and just see how beautiful things are and see how, like the one, right? When you're in that space, the wonder it creates. And that is something that has, I've been able to take into this waking life where it's like, holy fuck, can you believe like, we were talking about earlier before we got on that my son, Jake, you know, fractured his jaw in two places and we were, we were meeting with the doctor talking about surgery and in his x-ray, there were like two holes, like on each side of his chin. And we're like, well, what? I think Jake was like, what's that? It's like, oh, the, the, the nerve goes down through, through the bone, comes out across the chin, back in back through the other side. I'm like, you've got to be fucking wow. kidding me. Like we start, think about where we start from. We start from sperm and egg. And you're telling me that that eventually realizes that it's going to create this nerve that goes across your chin through the bone. Like, it, it, are we, is anybody paying attention to like how fucking amazing this is? We, and I know the brain is trying to conserve energy. So we just take things at face value because it's almost like, listen, I could spend my entire life trying to sort that one out and it's not practical, right? But can we pause for just a moment and see how fucking ridiculous, that's just one thing that the doctor pointed out. Like today I had, you know, as we were talking, I had Dr. Cowan on the, on the podcast and he's talking about 30,000 miles of blood vessels. Are you kidding me? Like, I can't wow. even wrap my head around wow. that. Wow. So anyway, a um, bit of a tangent there, but I, I, the, the, the wonder of these medicines and the doors that it opens up to me is it's amazing that it's finally coming to light. I feel very fortunate that I've been supported by men and women who are in, you know, kind of in this battle to make it, um, to bring it to many others for healing properties. So, and I know that's, that's been a big part of your work. And before we go there, I do, I want to just finish with the microdosing piece. Cause I feel like we, I didn't quite go as deep as I wanted to. And I know people are going to be listening who are curious. What are you 
currently? Is it something that is part of like a couple of times a week? Is it just when you're feeling it? Like when do you tap into this? And, and before we dive in, dive back into that, I just want to honor uh, your experiences and I'm really looking forward to unpacking uh, your psychedelic uh, healing journeys and your, your um, relationship with plant medicines and how they've informed your path. As uh, I, I truly admire your work and uh, feel like our messaging is very aligned. And, uh, you know, as we've talked about, we're both uh, from Chicago. We've cut our teeth in the big, the big windy city. Yes. And, um, you know, on this path of service and in this fascinating time right now to be of service to our human family and to be part of these conversations that, um, that I think we both suspect um, are, 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 are going to really matter. Um, and they matter now and they're going to, they're going to keep mattering as we, um, things get hairier and hairier with our, our human family and with all the kind of the craziness that's, that's going on. But, uh, back to microdosing, um, you know, Paul Stamets' stack is uh, five days on two days off. It's a regiment, it's a lifestyle design. It's a, um, you know, therapy protocol, whatever you want to call it can maybe all those three, you know, wrapped up in one. Um, but it's, uh, the kind of the magic with this protocol is that the, the dose is so low, it's subperceptual, and um, so there's no altered state at all. Um, but and it's, I've it just, I believe me, I've tried to tell Peyton this a thousand times. She's like, "Are you okay to drive?" I'm like, when it when I say subperceptible, I mean like I I can't tell. Like I'm actually a better driver right now, so it's safer that I drive now when I'm microdosing than when I'm not. So, it, but she just ex, you know thinks that. It, I'm about to have sense. a trip. And it makes sense because it is a nootropic, which is a um, you know, smart drug, essentially. So this is a protocol that, uh, that, they, that, that Paul labels as a nootropic and uh, you know, something that, that helps us elevate our courage, um, our focus. Um, it's, it's a deep practice that I also think is an integration strategy because we're, again, like with the sacred cacao that we're drinking, we're, we're local. We're in the body. We're not dis- disassociated like a, uh, a peak experience of psilocybin or ayahuasca might, might have you. So uh, the insights that we're, we're, we're gleaning and we're gathering when we're journaling or we're going about our work um, are a lot more um, concrete and, and uh, reachable and, and um, able to be integrated, uh, which means to make whole integration. Uh, so so it's, um, there's not as much lost in translation. And of course, the peak experience is very, very important uh, for uh, disrupting patterns for trauma. Um, and that's kind of the drum that I've been beating the last three to four years. Um, you know, frankly, I saw a lot of ungrounded people that were going back to the wishing well without doing any work in between. And they were wondering, you know, why things weren't changing in their life. So that, that was uh, something that really motivated me to, um, to put in the hard work and um, ultimately to to help uh, put out a message to this renaissance that, that uh, I feel is complements and helps people uh, kind of dial into that purpose of why they're here. I think all 7.3 billion of us have a, a, a unique uh, dharma and purpose, and, and we've probably never been more cut off from that purpose. Yeah, perfect. And I think that's a, a great place to we'll start talking about the book that you wrote. But um, I do want to give people a little something to land on so you can look up um, Paul Stamets stack with psilocybin. And there's a potent um, third wave uh, blog post. Okay. Uh, it's a short read, five minutes, eight minutes tops uh, that, that we'll, we'll put in the show notes. It's a game changer. I think the most important, arguably, uh, blog post in all of 2019. And it's got all the details about this uh, psilocybin stack. So you can do it safely. Great. And, and I've had... Um, I'm more prone to do the LSD micro microdose. It's just for some it's a little simpler, um, kind of have a similar experience each time. And, um, you know, I've shared this with a number of close friends, just kind of my experience and they've all been very curious. Um, and so they've kind of gone about figuring out how to, get on that regimen themselves and to, to, to a person, uh, it's been a very beneficial experience for them. And I think even, you know, like what I've experienced, um, is this heart opening, uh, as I, you know, on those days 
And then, you know, I do have the afterglow effect. And so the next day, if, you know, after I have, I have microdose, I have just more patience. I'm more connected. I remember I used to, when I would travel, I would microdose on that day because I want to get work done on the plane. And I noticed that my relationship to everyone that I would encounter, whether it was someone at TSA, a person at the ticket counter, someone scanning, like whoever, some, you know, someone, um, you know, a flight attendant, I just had time and patience and curiosity and, and all I could think of was fuck, like this just makes me a better person. But to your point, you're still in body. You're not just, you know, whacked out on some love drug and don't know what you're saying. Like you're totally getting the experience. And again, I think the benefit is getting those reps in so that when you're not on it, you still know what it feels like to be that connected to another. But that resonates big time. But it warms my heart to hear, fuels my heart to hear mm -hmm. your um, experiences with microdosing LSD. That's another uh, protocol uh, you know, that gets a lot of love. And, uh, you know, James Fadiman, he's the foremost uh, thought leader uh, when it comes to, or probably most established thought leader when it comes to microdosing. And every two or three days, is that something that you're, you're finding? Yeah. I generally do it a couple times a week. Okay. Um, I'll do it on days when I podcast. So perhaps I did it earlier today, Okay. but I just find that it gets me super dialed in. Um, I do know that for me to shift gears, um, cause as you know, like when you're, you're doing a podcast, you want to be prepared, you want to have everything just right. You could tell I was, I even mentioned it before we got on. I'm like, okay, we have no time frame here, but I just want to make sure I don't forget anything. And um, what I like to do generally is some hape right before I get on. That really grounds me. So, and people who've listened to my podcast know that, you know, hape is sacred um, tobacco from the Amazon. It is a tobacco snuff. Um, without going kind of too deep into that, it is is very grounding for me and kind of gets me back into, okay, whew, it's like this huge big kind of deep breath for me. You and I went and did a nice walk around the yard here with our shoes off, you know, bare feet in the grass, the sun. It's beautiful today. It's probably 70 degrees and just shared some of our cacao and some conversation, which is another great way to just kind of land into this kind of space. So those are some of the, you know, uh, I generally try to pick days that I need to be focused and get some stuff done. Um, so it's generally twice a week. Um, but I've had, yeah, like I said, just great results. And I know some people probably listen like LSD, you're going to lose your mind. Like just all the shit from, you know, years ago, propaganda. It's just not true. Now, that, if you take eight to 10. Is breaking down right now as we're seeing. Um, the last few weeks, um, that huge move in Oregon, that is a bold, bold move, assault on the war on drugs, the failed war on drugs, which I believe to be a war on black people and, and minorities uh, mm -hmm. or, and Latinos, um, you know, the greatest civil rights violation outside of slavery itself. Uh, and for Oregon, one of our great states to say, hey, you know, uh, we're going to decriminalize all drugs and we're going to make legal uh, it's my understanding, uh, psilocybin assisted therapy is legal. So that's, uh, times are changing, times are shifting. That sends a bold signal to the rest of the, uh, 50 States. And, um, you know, it's a wonderful time right now. We're seeing real progress. Mm, yeah. Beautiful. And I, you know, if people want to go dive deeper into the war on drugs and how it was started and what the, what led up to it and what, when, when it shifted, you know, when it was war on crime and war, war on whatever, Go watch the documentary 13. Um, I believe it's on Netflix by uh, Ava DuVernay, which is fucking phenomenal. But we'll, we'll link to that in the show notes. But anyway, let's get to your book. In, in whatever way you want to share, um, I know you start off the book, some very kind of personal pieces and then kind of go from there. And so I'd love for you to share a little bit of that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the book is a labor of love. I put a year and a half of my time, my heart and soul in uh, worth the fight, acting for a better world, a guide to spirituality, psychedelic medicines and overcoming trauma. Um, my intentions with the book, um, you know, there was a, um, it's a, a memoir. I share my story to the degree to which, um, 
I can leverage my story to tell a larger narrative about what is possible. And uh, this was the only way that I could see, um, you know, sharing this, this potent message. Um, the, the idea that I've been advocating for our United States war veterans for the last four years, uh, helping them get psychedelic therapy. And uh, so, so ultimately the book was written to lead up uh, in, in, the, in the final chapters um, towards the, the very important work that is, is happening right now as we speak um, with, uh, you know, there's, there's two organizations um, that I don't write about in the book because they weren't doing work at that time, but uh, the Heroic Hearts Project, uh, you know, we, we talked about uh, mm-hmm. earlier, um, Jesse, led by Jesse Gould, a former army ranger, and um, they are organizing ayahuasca healing retreats for our war veterans amid a mental health crisis and suicide epidemic. And uh, he's been on uh, the Worth the Fight podcast of um, number three and 39. And we had uh, Marcus and Amber Capone also on the Worth the Fight podcast. Um, uh, Marcus is a former Navy SEAL. Um, and uh, he and his bride, uh, Amber, have started a organization called Veterans Exploring Treatment Solutions, uh, VETS. And um, they are, they've drawn a line in the sand saying, hey, we're not going to budge. We're, we've lost too many of our, um, our, our Navy SEALs. And special forces to suicide. And, um, you know, there's plant medicines that work. There's plant medicines that Johns Hopkins and many of our other, um, most esteemed scientific institutions and uh, learning institutions have, have green lighted. And, um, so, so yeah, it's my hope and prayer that, um, you know, sharing this, um, sharing my story to, to, um, illuminate a larger narrative about what's possible. Um, you know, I've been calling for a love revolution since 2017 and, um, beating this love revolution drum and, and Hey, y'all, if, if we earnestly seek peace in this lifetime, there's no way around it. We've got to heal our war veterans. They can teach us everything that we're ignoring. Um, one group of people, one subgroup of people wrapped up into one, um, can teach us everything that we're ignoring as a people. Um, you know, and I affectionately call this, this ignorance, um, <clears throat> Uh, bullshit incorporated uh thank you stephen pressfield mm. and um mm. this this idea of um you know healing our war veterans brings up a lot of very uncomfortable questions that don't have clear answers at the top of the list uh, the the church that systematically uh, sexually abuses our children um big pharma that peddles these toxic uh, opioids and, and this pill a day model that we've been fed and led to believe is part of the human condition and um and just the industrial military complex. What are we 2020? What are we doing at war? Seriously? What are we doing at war? Um, and and I know that we're in a time right now where, where it feels like, um, I was just, just having this, this, this realization in the last week, this idea that, um, we're kind of in like a ceasefire, you know, we have a a common enemy right now with COVID and, and maybe there's an opportunity there that, that, um, that we can, uh, wake up and, and have some of these conversations right now um, and, and realize that we are a, a human family and, and, um, and we can start maybe shining light on some of these, these ideas as to, you know, what are we doing at war? The, the, my only, the, the only reason that I don't have a ton of hope for us to come to, together right now is because there's so much division, whether it's politically, whether it's mask, anti-mask, open, not open. It's just, I feel like people are losing sight of like, what the fuck is like, what is really going on? Right. And to your point, we have this common enemy, which no one can really even define what the hell it is. Scientists, doctors have to take these tests. We have to wear these masks, but, but arguably they're, they're ineffective. And I've had a couple of guests on the podcast recently, so I don't want to go back down that rabbit hole, but, um, and again, I don't mean to, come in and fucking doom and gloom right on the parade. I just, there's so much angst right now and it's not, it's almost like the common enemy has become one another. And is that by design? Well, if you watch the movie Plandemic or Social Dilemma or the creepy line, like, yeah, there are some fucking bad people at work and bad intentions out there. And, a lot of us are falling for it, which even more reason to go, you know, into these healing medicines to see that we are all connected. Mm-hmm. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't back up a little bit and talk about the number one thing on the list, which is, and we were talking about this before, but how, you know, you shared a statistic with me 
about the number of veterans that are subjected to sexual abuse. Yes. Which yeah. was staggering. And so I'd love for you to just talk a little bit more about that and give people a little bit of context for what that means. Absolutely. Yeah. The, um, and this, this is something that, that really drew me in. I was in month 17 of an 18 month travel journey and, um, you know, where I was, you know, by the way, just so just for my listeners, um, Matt had a, a very successful, you know, well, I'll just say successful in the corporate sense of the word, right? Like let's success is whatever you want it to be, but where he had an exit from a, a company that he started and he's like, I need to, well, I'll, I'll let you speak, but you, yeah, yeah, no, I, I worked my ass off for, for 15, 16 years, uh, had a business for, for seven of them. Uh, we sold it. It's my 35th birthday, October 16th, 19, um, or no, uh, 2014. And, uh, you know, I had this overwhelming urge to, uh, to, to, to get back and, and to, um, you know, help people that are struggling where I was. And, and two months later, I was in the jungles of Costa Rica, uh, drinking ayahuasca and, uh, that set forth a, um, you know, I, I took a year to kind of untangle myself from the mess that I'd created in corporate America and leave on good terms. And, uh, I traveled with a backpack for, for 18 months and month 17, uh, and it was a truth seeking journey. It wasn't vacation. You know, I was looking for, for where I can best fit in for the next 50 years of my life. And, uh, I came across this veteran organization that, um, was healing our warriors with, with ayahuasca and with, with these, uh, peak, uh, psychedelic plant medicine retreats. And, uh, I just felt a, a moral duty and obligation, uh, at that time to, to stand with our warriors. Um, you know, how was it that at, at, uh, 35, 36 years old, I was just finding out about the suicide tragedy. And, um, so it's, it's been my life's work since then to, um, to, to help, um, you know, create awareness around this, but it was this, this number that drew me in, uh, was, you know, when we're talking sample sets of 150, 200 people, uh, 90% of the war veterans that have been through the, um, the program of this organization that I was representing at the time, um, were, it was, it was the childhood sexual trauma that, that appears to be driving them to war. And this, uh, corroborates with, uh, Sebastian Younger's uh, research. He wrote, uh, Sebastian Younger is the foremost thought leader, uh, for PTSD, homecoming and belonging. He wrote a book called tribe. Amazing, amazing book. book. Absolutely. And, um, very brave book. And, and, um, he has some, a very, uh, you know, quote unquote, disturbing research, uh, that, that, um, indicates that our modern day war veterans that fought in Iraq and, Af and Afghanistan are two times more likely to have reported childhood sexual trauma in the early years of childhood development than those that fought at random in Vietnam. Mind you, I said, report anybody know, that knows anything about sexual shame knows that people would much rather eat a bullet than, than utter those words. And, um, so the, so this has been something that has, um, as a, an adult survivor of childhood sexual trauma, um, this has been, been something that is, has been up my craw and, and, uh, you know, tying the, this unchecked child sex abuse that is perpetuated that I believe is perpetuated by the Catholic church, uh, and tying that to war, um, the, the, this abuse of the, um, as, and I love how, how, uh, Sam Harris, he, he does a lot of very brave work around this. Um, but, but he, you know, he, he makes a point that if we had any fortune 500 company that habitually employs sexually confused men, we would run them out of town so fast, <laughs> but the fucking church gets a blind fucking eye. And, wow. uh, and it's, and it's true because, you know, the, you know, the, the, the church ties, uh, you know, to hell and, and, and there's such a, such a potent, strong, fearful programming that, um, that keeps people from broaching this, this taboo topic. Um, uh, there's been, um, you know, positive signals in the last 10 years, you know, there was a book or a movie called spotlight that, that yeah. came out that was, it was really brave. This really, you know, showing how, how nefarious, uh, this, this abuse is and the cover ups and the lies and the, and the deception. I believe that if we get a handle on this, this church sex abuse, um, we get a handle on war a generation or two out. And, uh, because it appears as though these, um, traumatized children, um, are enlisted. They're the ones that are, are, are going off to fight in our wars. And why are they called to war? I mean, you were sharing this with me, but for the listener, why are, why are these 
men and women called to war? Well, for those that, um, you know, and, and, and as somebody who can relate, um, you know, it's very, very difficult to connect authentically when you have trauma garbled up in your nervous system. Uh, so, so these people that are, are enlisting in the service, um, you know, time and time again, they don't have the ability to connect. They don't have tribe here. They, they can't connect with, with uh, intimate partners. They can't connect with uh, family on a deep heart and soul level. Cause there's that shame, that underlying shame, shame and the pain and the, and, and the, the thorniness of trauma of unresolved trauma. They can connect, um, you know, on, on like a physical standpoint, but you're not going to get the good kind of the, 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 what satiates again, our heart and our soul, that deep level of, of connection. So they go to war to find that and they find tribe, they find brotherhood. You're always with somebody, you got the buddy system going on. And, um, but when they come back home, they, they, they never had the tribe here. Uh, you know, they have these traumatic memories. They don't know, they don't have coping skills and ways to deal with them. And thus we have the veteran suicide tragedy and, and epidemic. We got 22 that die by their own hand every single day. That number is likely far greater. Um, you know, so many are stuck in self-abuse and the opioid crisis, which claims 193 per day, um, 193 people and not, not necessarily veterans. And, uh, I, I believe 10 to 15% of our, our homeless population are veterans too. Yeah. That's heavy shit. Yeah. Sorry to get heavy. No, but it's okay. That's, that's why you're doing the work. And so I'd be curious to know, since the book has come out, what, what has been some of the, um, maybe unsurprising things that have unfolded that, that you didn't necessarily kind of anticipate good or bad, you know? Uh, you know, it's been, it's been a big challenge. It's been a big challenge. I'm pushing forward a very provocative message and, um, but uh, you know, when it comes to, and I got some really good, tough love from, from a mentor of mine, Stephen Kotler. He wrote the book, uh, stealing fire. Yeah. He's and, a mentor of yours. Um, you know, I, I, I did his writing, writing class and, yeah. uh, you know, flow for writers workshop. So I use the, uh, you know, um, the mentorship, uh, you know, his book has, has impacted me in a profound manner. He's been on my podcast and, um, you know, his work around flow states and flow science is, is uh, second to none. And, uh, you know, he gave me some good, tough love, uh, when I, I opened up and, you know, Hey, I'm struggling getting this, getting this message out. And he said, Hey, you know, a, 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 a message as provocative as yours, uh, you know, trying to bring, um, this, this healing to our most conservative, you know, our, our veterans, uh, most conservative subpopulation in America, um, you know, don't evaluate a success, uh, you know, whether the, the book is a win or a loss until you're six years out. So just get, you know, just own the checklist each day. Yeah. So that, that was really helpful. And, um, but, but the, the reviews that I've, I, I've, you know, got 33 really strong reviews on Amazon and that number keeps growing. And, and, uh, on a weekly basis, I'm hearing uh, stories from people like, Whoa, your, your book really touched my heart. So that keeps me in the game, keeps me focused on serving. And, um, and I think our times are catching up to the book too. Now that, uh, you know, we've talked about what, what's going on in Oregon and, uh, we're seeing real change here. And, um, you know, going back to that, that drum, that love revolution drum and to your point about, um, uh, what's going on with COVID and, and, and these forces, um, uh, the nefarious forces perhaps, uh, that, that are polarizing us intentionally polarizing our society more and more. And, and, and I think that that lends for, um, even an opportunity here with, with, you know, what is something that hits us all square smack dead in the heart? Uh, that no one can hide from, um, you know, is this, this idea that we have a veteran suicide tragedy and epidemic, and this is a love-based solution, something that, that, um, you know, is, uh, the left and the right or, Hey, everybody's thumbs up for, for, for getting medicines that work to our war veterans. And, uh, so in these times of discord where so much is driving us apart, um, why don't we come together over healing our war veterans, uh, getting them psychedelic medicines, plant medicines that actually work and, um, and, and taking an honest inventory of the pill a day model that, uh, again, we've been fed and led to believe is part of the human condition. Mm, yeah. And before, uh, and I want to actually dive into actually the, the work that you have been doing with the veterans with the plant medicines. Before we do that, I wanted to ask you, do you feel like you said what you wanted to say 
in the book. And, and I say that knowing that every day we learn new stuff and it's like something I thought a month ago, there's going to be a change in maybe the way I feel, but given what your intention was with the book, do you feel, because to me, like at the end of the day, right? Are you happy with the book? Did you say what you wanted to say? Irrespective of what any, any reviews or anybody, you know, who gets triggered by it. Um, how do you feel about it? I feel great about it. Yeah. Fuck. yeah I feel like it was, uh, you know, um, I completed my mission and, um, you know, like I, I told you a moment ago when we were walking outside, um, I'm out on a little, a little bit of a limb with this in, in terms of, of, you know, I pledged all of the proceeds to our war veterans amid a mental health crisis and suicide epidemic. So it's, it's my hope and prayer that this, this, this book is a, um, you know, a lottery ticket that might be cashed in someday. Um, and, 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 you know, to, you know, continually have these connections and get on podcasts and to keep sharing, uh, with the hopes that, that, um, you know, it, it, it might get its due. And we might sell a boatload of copies so we can raise a, a shit ton of money for our war veterans. And, and again, they can lead us, they can push this edge and lead us into this unknown. And um, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, like we, we were talking about when our war veterans raise their hand, we you know, all just shut up and listen. And there's so much lessons. They, they have these, the, the, the lessons um, to teach us. And I believe the degree to which we um, understand and, and lean into and acknowledge our darkness is the very same degree to which we can stand and share and love in our light. And they know darkness. They've seen a real life hell. And, um, so, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's something that I've been putting out and, and, uh, with hopes of, um, yeah, selling more books and, and, uh, supporting these veteran organizations that have drawn a line in the sand and they're not budging. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's something that I believe that, uh, in, in time, um, you know, that, that, has the potential to help a lot of people that are, you know, a lot of warriors that are struggling and stuck in the darkness. Yeah. And I love what we were talking about, you know, before we got on this, this whole idea. Um, and again, you just mentioned it. Um, these war veterans don't talk about something that they, they know of. They fucking experienced it. Like, and anyone who's listened to my podcast knows that I, I, I beat the drum on experience all day long because we can learn what we want in, Jim Fadiman's psychedelic, you know, explorer's guide. But until we go and actually try to microdose, we don't fucking know. Sh we don't know anything. So what's your experience with that? Right. And so as you were telling me, sharing with me, like if we can help these veterans heal and, you know, I had, you know, Boyd Vardy's been on my podcast a couple of times. And one of the things he's really big on because of his own experience with trauma, three extremely traumatic experiences, healed trauma, like you talked about earlier, like unhealed, healed trauma is medicine. And yes, we, we hate to see anyone go through trauma, but if we can support which what you're doing, if, if we can continue to support these men and women who've been through this traumatic experience, we can help them heal, which by all means, I, and I want to get into what you're seeing and, you know, from your experience of, of how, how much healing is happening with these medicines. But if these men and women can bring that medicine, it comes from a place of experience, right? Experience and soul. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and, um, you know, kind of going back to like the social dilemma and some of these, uh, you know, said in the various forces, like the, the, the polarization, our polarized society is only going to get more polarized. And, and I believe that mistrust is growing exponentially. We're all getting wham -basted each day with digital deluge and, and data coming in from every different angle. And how do we, how do we keep our ba balance and how do we keep our harmony? Um, but, but with that said, um, I believe that, that those that have acted, those that have served, those that have gone ahead and backed up their words with, with doing, um, that their experiences, um, are going to matter even more so in the year, in the months and the years to come as, um, again, trust is eroding what's going on in our world. So we, 
we can trust our warriors, our, our veterans. They've, they've fought, they've signed on the dotted line and they've, 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 they've pledged their lives, um, to, to serving our nation and serving our human family. And that's the spirit that I see. And that's why I'm so gosh darn hopeful because I'm like, whoa, we have this, this incredible group of people that are, uh, that are loyal, that have honor, that have integrity, and they're begging to have medicines that actually work so they can serve and they can give back to their communities. And, uh, that spirit of get shit done is, is a, is an asset for the psychedelic and the uh, psychedelic Renaissance and the, uh, the spiritual communities that, that, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's been incredible what, 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 what we've seen and, uh, and how these veterans, they know, they know leadership and they know discipline. They just need medicines that work. And then they take the ball, they run with it. They give back to their people. I think of this as an exponential solution too, because they're, they're male, they're female, they're black, they're white. They're Latino, they're Asian American, they're indigenous American, they're rich, they're poor, they're, they're all the different religions, they're us, and they're in all of our communities. Uh, so, so when we get this, this tipping point, I think that this could uh, really make a big difference for um, everybody that's sitting on the sideline, really curious about you know, uh, movements like what, what, what's happened in Oregon, what the, the studies that are happening at Johns Hopkins, NYU, UW, Madison, UCLA, and, and, and are wondering, cause people are traumatized. They're hurting. And, um, uh, these modalities that are in place, they're not, they're not working. No, they're not. And yeah, it, it's, it's, you know, I'd love again for you to share, um, your kind of hands-on work. Like what, what are you seeing? um, in the different organizations that you've been connected with, um, for the efficacy of, of, um, you know, I think a, a lot of times they, they, the veterans don't come to the plants until they've, I don't fail this, these other, uh, means the pills haven't worked. Right. And so treat, they call it treatment, treatment resistant depression, PTSD, stuff like that. Like what, what are you seeing, um, as you've been doing this work? You know, people are waking up to this potential, uh, solution. And, uh, you know, there's been, you know, we were just talking earlier about how, uh, Jesse Gould and the Heroic Hearts Project were featured in the new, in the New York times. And, uh, you know, there's, there's been a lot of very brave, um, there was a documentary a few years back, uh, from shock to awe which highlights two veteran families that are shifting out of the pharmaceutical model into plant medicine healing. And, um, it was really, uh, enlightening and, and, uh, but also disturbing. I mean, that we're giving, that we're sitting on the sidelines right now while the standard playbook is, is at, at times giving our veterans, our, our warriors, 30 to 50 different pills and, and expecting that they're going to, going to, going to heal. And, um, it's sick. It's really sick. And, and, um, you know, it's, uh, the, the, the profit motive is, has warped our, uh, our, our, our viewpoint of what it's going to take to, to, to heal this trauma. And, um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen nothing but positive signals. Um, and the heroic hearts project are do, doing incredible work veterans exploring treatment solutions there's a bunch of other veteran organizations that again have drawn that line in the sand saying hey we're not going to budge you know enough is enough and um you know there's so much to be hopeful for as uh you know they they bridge this gap this this massive gap they're not just bridging it for themselves they're bridging it for for everyone because they've taken this oath to protect and to serve and uh they realize that uh, that they're country is in a tough bind right now. We're in a mental health crisis, uh, not just our war veterans, but, mm. but us all, you know, and now, uh, the walls of truth are, are, are encroaching on us all with, with, with COVID and, and, um, you know, the, the heaviness that we're feeling with the racial injustice and, um, you know, the election and, and so on. Yeah. Beautiful. It's, um, you know, one of the things you had mentioned to me earlier that I thought was very astute was that these warriors, again, when they speak, not only do we listen, but I mean, they're the ones who are willing to stand up to the tyranny, 
Again, we were talking, we've mentioned it a few times, whether it's the creepy line, pandemic, social dilemma. There are forces at work, whether you want to believe it or not, a lot of it's happening in Silicon Valley. And I was talking with Paul Check on this in the podcast. It's like, we're no longer, like we're not being censored by the government. Like that's China's deal, right? Now look at China, they're censoring. We're being censored by corporations that are based in Silicon Valley that are our new media, which is social media. And maybe some of you are happy because it's slanting your way. I don't go one way or the other, but when it's slanting one way, it makes me want to stand up for the way that it's not slanting. And I think it's doing everyone a serious injustice by having, I mean, they're, they're, <laughs> please, if you don't believe me and maybe you won't believe it when you just open your hearts in your minds to any of these documentaries, and it will show you that this is not good for us. We need to stand up to what's happening. There are people, again, like I mentioned, pandemic series, Mickey Willis is doing a lot of work on that front, and he's making the movie available on the website for free because it won't go up on YouTube. No other services will put it up, but these are important movies, right? Google doesn't want it up because it's calling them into question. I believe they're tangled in with YouTube and all that. Anyway, it's, they're, they're, they're all in bed together. It's super fucked up. But our war veterans, when healed, they will storm this fuck beach. Fuck, they will. They will fucking storm this beach and they won't stand for the bullshit. And uh, they, they didn't go overseas. And they didn't lose their brothers and sisters and put themselves in the harm's way that they did. Whether you believe in war or not, I'm, I'm not a big fan of war. I just see the immense opportunity here of of this group of people that need medicines that work so they can heal they can get right and they can show us how to serve they can show us what it means to love to truly love your fellow man and your country and that shit that spirit is contagious and mm-hmm. and it can spread just like this this covid thing is spreading it can spread we can spread uh virtues of honor and courage and selflessness those ancient warrior uh virtues that they that they have and, and, and that are largely lying dormant and um, they just need the, the, the dance with mother ayahuasca, or they need that, uh, that MDMA assisted psychotherapy that, that maps is pushing forward. They need that, um, that psilocybin assisted therapy that, that Oregon has, has given thumbs up to. And um, yeah, I mean, we could sit back and just let them, let them go to work, you know, and, 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 and let them show the way into this unknown. Yeah. And so I would say for, for any veterans listening or anybody listening who is, you know, a family member or, you know, has a connection to our veterans, like what, what's the kind of most, like, what's the simplest thing for them to do to kind of get into this network, this, you know, get on the right path what we, what you and I would agree is the right path to healing. What's the, the simplest kind of way forward? I would say uh, education is, and um, you know, checking out organizations like the Heroic Hearts Project. Uh, you can find them on Instagram. They, uh, you know, Jesse's making the podcast rounds and and really putting out a lot of very useful, high vibe content. And his very ground, sane way of looking at these medicines is a blessing and a gift to this renaissance. As um, you know, you would you would look at him, and 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 I think that veterans they kind of um, they. They create dissonance uh, in in what you think a s- someone using psychedelic medicines might look like or mm. might uh, <laughs> the, the perception that they give off. And I'm, I think you and I are trying to do that as well. Like, look, yeah, I'm not. I don't look like a hippie, but I certainly think like one sometimes. So, whatever that means. Yeah, beautifully said. And, um, but yeah, it, you know, education and uh, checking out these different organizations, checking out the studies, checking out what Maps is doing. Um, you know, reading up on the de- decriminalization movements that are happening all over our country, every big city, every metropolis right now in the U.S., there is a uh, an initiative that is going on right now. As um, again, this war on drugs is is under assault. We're waking up to uh, just how egregious this racist policy from Richard Nixon, 1971, the Controlled Substances Act, from Tricky Dick. And, and the Watergate administration, we still have drug laws that are largely in place from that administration. And um, yeah, I mean, these, these laws were void of science and, and were for um, 
really kind of effed up uh, reasons. I mean, there's, there's some really, uh, you know, some, some power quotes that came out in the last 20 years about, uh, you know, Nixon and, 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 and how they, you know, I'm gonna, uh, the, the, this idea that, that they, they made heroin uh, illegal uh, so they could, they could break up the, um, uh, the, the, the blacks, uh, black Panthers and, and uh, you know, the African-American communities. And uh, they, they associated uh, you know, marijuana with the hippies to, um, because they couldn't make, you know, uh, being black or uh, being anti-war left illegal. I mean, and, and, and I totally just butchered that, but, but you get the, you get the sense, you get the, yeah. you get the sense of it. And, you know, I, I went down this rabbit hole, um, after watching, uh, again, the documentary 13th that you yeah. mentioned earlier and, um, you know, being a Chicago guy, I was really curious about Fred Hampton. Oh fuck. So, I went and read about that too. So I listened to that audio book and I was just like, I can't believe that I lived in Chicago for 15 years and I never heard of Fred Hampton and the fact that, that the FBI and our. Yeah. Our explain, federal- explain, like, take your time to explain this fucking story. Cause it, it, I, when I read it, I'm like, this is this, this can't be true. That yeah. Is. Yeah. This, um, and this is all stuff that you can, you can read. Um, you know, I think it was, uh, Jeffrey Haas, uh, or Laswell, I forget his name. Um, but, but a, a very brave audiobook. He was a civil rights attorney for Fred Hampton and his family. Uh, Fred Hampton was uh, 20 years old, a, uh, charismatic, charming, uh, black Panther leader, um, who our government feared because he could unite both the whites and the blacks. And, uh, he was shot, um, in the forehead at four 30 in the morning, um, next sleeping next to his pregnant girlfriend. And, uh, just a really effed up story about, um, you know, the, the corruption and, uh, what happened in yesteryear, you know, the last time around we had this surge of, um, you know, the civil rights movement, and, uh, a lot of, there was a, there was a, um, an illegal, I want to say organization, but uh, initiative that our government had called Cointel Pro, And its mission was to take out and destabilize all of these leaders of these, um, you know, black organizations. So they were killing their leaders and, um, and, you know, so they could, they were essentially hapless after not having any, any leadership. And, um, and then, you know, the, the, the debacle with, uh, making these drugs, uh, schedule ones with, with harsh, uh, prison sentences that, that, you know, um, they cover in depth in 13th and and so on. And, um, it's, it's, it's fucked up. Um, and it's a shameful part of our, uh, of our past. And, um, and I think that, you know, I given a lot of thought to, I think we're in a different time right now and because of of what happened in yesteryear, we have this movement and, and, um, it's, it's, there's no heads to cut off, you know, because the social media and the way that we're, um, we're able to, to disseminate and, and put this content out, um, that, that I think that we're going to have a different outcome and I'm seeing, um, and, and very hopeful for, for where we're at, uh, with, with real change on the horizon. Mm, yeah. I hope, like I said, I hope you're right. Just we're, I feel like we're in the belly of it right now. And I think the election probably made the belly seem a lot deeper. Um, but that's okay. We need to know what we're all dealing with. And I think a lot of people struggle with telling, telling people how they feel. You know, a lot of times we'll just support things with facts or quote unquote facts and other ideas, but it's, it's not people have a hard time just saying, you know what, this thing scares me. If we can just get to that level of honesty about ourselves and be okay being scared and naming it, then we can start having conversations like, look, I'm scared about this. You're scared about something different. You know, you're one party, I'm the other party. Like, let's, like, it can't be that, like, you know, if you're a Republican and you believe all these things and you're a Democrat, and you believe all these things, they're just like diametrically opposed and like, like one person's right. Like how, like I just, it just is never, it's just never made sense to me. Um, I think for a while when I didn't understand, I identified maybe as a Republican, but I think it's, it's all kind of nonsense, you know, and I think we should, uh, or I would, I would hope that we would 
just lean into how things make us feel and what makes the most sense in our heart, not with, you know, how everything's being framed with what we're reading. And, and again, we're not reading everything. We don't have access to everything. Google will not give you access to everything. Facebook will not give you access to everything. And so, and certainly as we've seen in the election with Twitter, they suppressed all, you know, a, a, obviously a very healthy bit of negative Biden news with his son Hunter and what was going on in the Ukraine and, and that whole thing. There was no such suppression of anything that was negative about Trump. And again, I'm not a fucking Trump guy, but someone has to stand up to what's going on. And unfortunately, if you're, and again, I want to speak carefully here. Fucking everybody just listen, okay? Unless you're okay with just one ideology running all of the media, and if you are, fucking A, you've got to be kidding me. Just go somewhere, go to China and, and be part of that. See how that worked out. Like this, we need both parties, even though they're asinine, but we need the left and the right to keep one another in check, and that is not happening. And I think everybody who wants, you know, we have this runoff in Georgia and they want the Democrats to fucking sweep everything. We're fucked. You may think because you're quote unquote, you identify with the left that that's the best thing that's ever going to happen. It's not. I promise you, we need each other to check each other because people at that level are not looking out for the constituents. Honestly, they never have. Okay. They are looking out for their special interest, the people who are putting money in their pockets. Special interest that really is scary. Yeah, like how much money are the constituents giving to? The, it's a pittance if they're giving any versus what Big Pharma is giving and all the other special interests. And so if people can just understand that, and it's not anyone's fault, it's just what we're, what we're dealing with, we need to check one another. That's why they have, you know, the executive branch, the legislative branch and the judicial branch, they are there to check one another. And if there's none, if there's no kind of counter in any of those uh, branches, we're in trouble. And you, again, you may think because you're on the quote unquote right side of it, that it's great. It's fucking not. No one with absolute power acts in a way that's for the greater good. And so we need this. Um, not sure how I got on that ramp, but I'm just, I'm, I'm worried that everything that's moving very far to the left and really trouncing on civil liberties and what people can say and what can be printed in censorship. I thought that's what the fucking left stood for. Am I wrong? I thought they were all about this. And so if someone could explain that to me, maybe I do have it wrong. I've had shit wrong before in the past, but if we, if what we're able to say is challenged, like, like, I just, I'm having a hard time with it right now. And I think everybody's getting caught up. There's a lot of grandstanding going on on the left. Um, people that honestly, six months ago were like open heart, let's do this. And now all of a sudden, they're dancing on graves. And it's like, well, wait a minute. I thought you, you know, wait. And now Joe Biden's the one that's going to be there to unite everyone. Like, I, I just, there's so much contradiction going on. Um, and again, I don't, I don't want this went political. <laughs> and I, and I, my somewhat apologies for that, but obviously it was, it's weighing on me. And I had to kind of speak a little bit about what I feel around that but we can we can go on to some lighter subjects if you'd like oh no i love it i love it thanks for the honest um expression of what's on your heart and um you know i i, I i'm concerned about the cancel culture and some of the things that you were talking about with kyle and and um you know the i guess what's alive for me is is um and, and a potential solution um you know moving forward uh you know, something that, that has rocked my world was, was that social dilemma was, was really, really disturbing. Um, just, just how much, um, you know, so, so, I mean, 
in order to create the macro change, I think the only way to do that is to do it on the individual level, you know, to, for us uh, to do our work and do our inner work and do our shadow work and, and to be the best versions of ourself um, in that spirit of, of, of supporting our veterans, like we we're talking about and, and, and about how that, that um, spirit, spirit of integrity, honor, uh, courage is, is contagious. And, um, you know, this, this idea of the, 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 the social dilemma and how, um, you know, these the big tech are, are, are preying on our psychological vulnerabilities. Uh, I've been, been doing, um, you know, I'm a week or two weeks into a, a digital minimalism experiment right now with, uh, with my favorite, most trusted author, Cal Newport. He's a MIT thinker who is a Georgetown professor at Georgetown. He wrote, uh, you know, he's written a bunch of incredible books, be so good. They can't ignore you deep work. And now he's got a book where he outlines, um, a strategy to combat, uh, the, um, the, the struggles that I think we're all having right now. And, 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 uh, you know, you, you bravely put that into words, kind of the angst and this, this dis-ease that we feel uh, with what's going on in the world, but uh, taking the power back into our hands, um, the, this, this idea that I thought before, uh, if you'd asked me two, three months ago, I would have said that, you know, big tech and Silicon Valley, it's, it's neutral, you know, uh, just like Shakespeare said, you know, it's uh, nothing's good or bad. Only thinking makes it so. And, uh, after doing some, some digging, um, you know, it's not neutral and, and these, uh, you know, big tech, uh, plays, uh, on our psychological vulnerabilities. And there's some really effed up things that are happening. Um, I haven't done the dive that, that maybe you've done in, in terms of, of understanding, um, you know, politically how this, you know, it's almost over my skis. Um, sure. sure. And, and same and, here. <laughs> and, and, uh, I try to just, just really stay in my lane and, and, uh, but, but the idea that, that we can, uh, do that we can be proactive and educate ourselves on ways to, uh, create healthier relationships with technology, with social media, um, this idea, and I guess I could sum up uh, Cal Newport's book about digital minimalism, is he outlines a strategy for us to eat the shit out of the bait, but to not take the hook from big tech mm. and from these, these, um, these uh, you know, social media companies, Facebook, Instagram, and, um, and, you know, he envisions, um, I don't know if it'll happen or not. It's a, you know, that, that, uh, that a, a 10 X drop in, in the next decade, um, that, that they've overstepped their boundaries in a 10 X manner. So, um, that they have a place in our culture, but they've run ramshot on us. And, uh, the idea that a big tech right now is tomorrow's big tobacco. And, uh, once we come to light with, with what they know what they're doing and they're doing it anyways for the almighty dollar and it's 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 screwed up and it's 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 greedy and um yeah i mean that's that's what's alive for me mm, yeah thank you for that and you know it's and again i i want to be clear like each one of these organizations corporations started out as a couple of people with an idea and now all of a sudden they need 50,000 fact checkers or community watchers whatever like it, that wasn't, they never started out with that intention. I would, I would argue if they did, then holy shit, they fucking nailed it. But like they, they, they turned into something much different, um, from their kind of original ethos. And so again, I think these things just have gotten out of hand. And I think Douglas Murray, and I talked about this, I think, yeah, I'm sure I talked about it extensively with Kyle, but Douglas Murray's book, The Madness of Crowds. And um, I highly recommend it to everyone because it really goes into what happens when a group starts to, what we've seen in the past, when they start to gain power, what happens, you know? And a lot of times what we're seeing right now is that narrative is getting pushed further and further and further away from center. And granted, it may be going in your direction. It may be on your side of that continuum, but if we get too far away from center, we're in trouble. You're not going to like it, I promise. But unfortunately, I feel like we're going to have to go there. And I think maybe that's what Cal is referring to. Like, we're going to fucking get so far out on one side that people are going to be like, we can't, this is untenable. 
you know, so I highly recommend that book. And if, and if you don't want to, if you're not sure about the book, listen to him on uh, Joe Rogan. I think he was on in September. Amazing Doug, interview. Douglas Murray. Douglas Murray. Okay, yeah. Really good. Get the audio book. I mean, he's, he's got this great British accent and he's a bit of a jokester um, and he's really entertaining and sarcastic. So highly recommend that. But anyway, so tell me this, you're working with, I'm going to shift gears a little bit because there's another thing. So we both were in Chicago for many years, our formative kind of corporate years. Um, but now you, you lead men's groups and so do I. And so I'd love to hear a little bit about um, what you're doing. And is it the Worthy Fight Mastermind? Worthy Fight Mastermind. It's not necessarily a men's group. It's open to both. Oh, sexes. thanks for um, correcting that. Yeah, yes. Yeah, and I'm, I'm ultra curious about your work and um, you know, love to illuminate and, and, and to hear uh, about your successes as I've been keeping an eye on, on what you're doing. And uh, I think that it's, it's so important um, and it's, it's really awesome to see that that uh, the way that you're carrying on that fit for service, I know that you trained with Aubrey and, mm -hmm. and um, you know, are paying this forward. I feel like, you know, you have this calling to uh, bring men together and to, um, to, to give them that, that bond and that brotherhood. And uh, what, what are you, what are you experiencing? Yeah. So thanks. Um, I, I started something, launched the, the first session was the unlearned experience. It launched in the beginning of September and it was basically, my idea was to, to take this kind of eight weeks online, bring in, so again, the unlearned experience. How can I share my experience with others? And it's a brotherhood. So it is, it is just for men right now, but there are, we are going to open up some other, Peyton and I hopefully going to do some stuff together for, for couples or for men and women and, and the like. But the idea was to create this brotherhood, but bring in teachers that I've worked with, guides that I've worked with, um, to share their medicine with these brothers. And, you know, my thought was each of these people have, have had a really strong impact on my life. What if I curated this group and allowed it to, maybe it was really easy for someone to say I'm in and they get to work with each of these on some level, each one of these, um, guides. And so that was the, the kind of the inspiration. What I found was a group of men that were deeply needing a brotherhood, especially now when there's the social distancing. And, you know, here it's, it's pretty open down in Austin. So I get to see friends and there's no kind of like masks or anything like that. But in general, people are isolated. Certainly as you go up north and in Chicago and I had some people from up there, but it really created this container for men to connect. And then ultimately at the end, we had a retreat here in Austin. And so many of the men were able to travel. Some weren't because they were in, in different cities or states that said, if you go to fucking Texas, <laughs> you're going to quarantine for 14 days. So they couldn't come. And then we had a couple, couple men that were international and they certainly couldn't come. But it, it was an amazing experience. So we've launched... Um, we're about halfway through the second one. And the idea is that the unlearned experience folds into this thing called the unlearned brotherhood. And so that's going to launch in the beginning of 2021. And instead of like every week we, we have a call um, and each week it's either with an expert or it's just the brothers, you know, an integration circle type call would be just for the brothers. What we're going to do is we're going to go deeper into some of this work that we've done. And so each month, we're going to have it dedicated to one expert like Boyd Vardy will be one of the, the he'll probably kick it off um, in February, March. We're going to bring on James Fitzgerald. Who's going to talk a lot about just the relationship to fitness and wellness and what that looks like. James been a, a, on the podcast a couple of times. And then we're going to bring on uh, a good friend of mine, Dr. Craig Conover. We're going to talk a little bit more about medicine, but with the biohacking in mind. And what does that look like? And he's one of these guys who, though he has a physician's license, he has that biohacker's mind. And so he's really trying to optimize and he's really doing some cool stuff. And so I've been uh, fortunate enough to have been working with him for a couple of years now through my relationship with Kyle. Um, and so... Unlearned experience feeds into unlearned brotherhood, which becomes this ongoing thing. And then the unlearned experience retreat, the unlearned brothers will be there. And so it becomes this growing 
community, this growing tribe, and it becomes this thing that takes on a life of its own. And I mean, just to just to see the reaction from the guys after a couple of weeks. You know, the first week is just us and to get to know one another. Week two, we bring on Boyd Vardy. Week three, between the call um, with Boyd and the week three call, each guy does Enneagram work. And then we have Dr. Jerome come on and discuss the Enneagram. So they've done their individual calls with him. Almost to a man after that third week, and this is an eight-week thing, they're like, if it was over right now, like I got more than my money's worth. They're just so blown away by the medicine that these men have been able to share with them. And they're not even halfway done. And so it's fun for me to be able to facilitate that, but also um, to be a true student in that. You know, I'm guiding the conversation with Boyd or Dr. Jerome or Laura or Diane, but ultimately I'm in there doing the work with everyone else. And I think that's the real medicine there is that I'm not sitting up like I've got this all figured out. No, I've had these experiences that have woken me up. They've created a, a lot more curiosity and questions than answers, but let's walk along this path together, you know? And so I think that was some of the feedback I got from the first group was just that, that it was, they felt like we were all in it together. Um, and that's just where I like to sit, you know, there, I may know a, a little bit about some things cause I've had the opportunity to have more experiences around it. And maybe I'm pushing some edges and I'm curious whether it's psychedelic medicines or whatever the thing is. I will go into that. You know, that's my nature. And like I said, with the cacao, like I'm going to have a, a prolonged experience with this so I can really understand it. I can read about it till the cows come home, but until I get my hands on it and understand it in that way through experience, I don't fucking know about it. You know, I'm not good at retaining information that I read, but if I've done it, I can tell you all about it. Cause that's my truth with fill in the blank. And so that's, I guess in a nutshell, a bit of the work I'm doing right now that I'm really excited about. And I love, you know, obviously doing this podcast is so much fun for me and really energizing. Um, I've had a book in the works. I've had the rough copy since beginning of June and I haven't opened it. And, you know, for, uh, for maybe a couple of months, I was feeling some guilt, like, fuck, like, come on, man, like, just do it. And, and then I, it occurred to me, it's just not that time for me. It's not that time for me to sit and contemplate. Like I'm in, I'm in it right now. I'm still, whatever these experiences are that I'm having, my son, you know, as some of you know, my, my, my oldest uh, fractured his jaw recently and uh, senior in high school. And, um, basketball player and just came off just an amazing summer in, in fall season where he was playing the best I've ever seen. He was having so much fun. He was so excited for this season. And for not only that to be, you know, not an option right now, hopefully he'll get back um, before the season's out, but to see him with these fucking jaws fractured and he has to, he could undergo surgery. And so here I am, you know, talk about learning. Um, how can I show up for him? What, what do I do? You're doing it, brother. <laughs> you are. But he's hurting so bad. And, you know, it's, it's times like that when you reach out to your people. And, um, you know, I was fortunate enough to, like, you know, I reach out to Boyd, who's had his experiences with trauma and how to heal that. And he guides people through that now. And he just, just made sure that I gave enough space for me to have my sadness and anger and, and all the things I needed to feel before I really got to that point of the greater knowing that this is for something greater than I could know right now. And to not rush to that moment, just to feel it. And it allowed me to sit with Jake when he came out of surgery 
and had his mouth wired shut. And I liken it to, um, I would imagine a woman giving birth for the first time. You don't know what it's going to be like until you go through that experience. You can read about it. You can see it in videos. And until you giving birth, you don't know. And for him, he probably had an idea of what it felt like to have his jaw wired shut. But when it actually happened and he was at home and he went to do something that he would do drinking water and we just couldn't figure out how to get the water in and it was like I felt every bit of his helplessness and hopelessness and there was nothing I could do except cry with him It was, it was the hardest thing I've had to experience as, as a father. And I just felt it. And I just sat with it. And I didn't try to make it feel better. And I didn't try to bypass the experience. I just sat with it. And what happened was, the next day, he started to adapt. And he started to figure out how to drink water and how to take his medicine. And there was a light in him. He could feel when just a day earlier, he would say, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do this. And when your son is telling you he can't do it, and you know that he's meaning it, he's not trying to get out of anything. He truly, in his heart, he's like, I can't do this. And I'm thinking, I don't know how the fuck he's going to do this. Like, he wanted to cut the wires right then. And I'm like, I, I don't blame you. Like, I don't, I just, again, I felt helpless. But everything changed that next day. And, you know, here we are. It's, it's Monday. And I've just never seen anything like it in my life. And just to watch my son go through this experience. And it's not like every moment he's happy, but there is light in him right now. And I guess my point in bringing all this up is that I'm, this is all learning for me. This is all stuff for me to share in some way. And so that's why the book's not being worked on right now. I'm doing the important work rather than kind of memorializing it. And to, to what you'd said with your book, like I have the same framework, I need to speak through my experience because that's what I'm connected to. And maybe there's other things to share within that. There are lessons that I've learned through different books, the hard to articulate it, but it's only because I've had the experience that I feel that I have any authority or any liberty to speak on these things. And so I'm excited for the book. I have fucking no idea when it's going to come out and I don't care. I don't, I don't care at all. So don't, you know, if you're waiting for it, I'm sorry. I got, I got no deadlines. And really what's alive for me is, is that the, the book is, is coming together as we speak and, yeah. and, uh, you are, uh, filling up and, and, and gathering so many data points and so many referential points. You're living, you're acting, you're, you're in the fight and, and doing your work and doing your service work. And, um, yeah, I mean this, this is, um, again, you know, referential data points, and more for you to pull together when the time is right. And uh, we are in a pandemic right now and you're performing at a very high level, serving people with your uh, support groups and, and with this brotherhood. And um, it was amazing to hear about your experiences and, and uh, this uh, spirit of vulnerability that you're embracing. Uh, I think vulnerability is a superpower in the world that we're shifting into. And, and so, uh, walking the talk and being there as the pace car, the vulnerable pace car for your brothers, for your tribe that you're growing and developing with this podcast is, is really inspiring to see and a tremendous service to our human family. Uh, without vulnerability, we, we don't have trust without trust. We can't connect. Connection is the one reason why we're here and, um, yeah, love, love to hear it. And, and I'm again, really inspired about, uh, you know, how you've, you know, started this podcast, 
uh, you know, kicking ass and taking names. You've had a lot of amazing guests and, and the content that you're putting out is, is, is super high vibe. And um, to, to be able to bring together people in this quick of a manner uh, is really, really inspiring to me and, and, and undoubtedly many others that are looking to serve in a similar capacity. Thank you for that, brother. So well, should we land it there? Let's do it. Unless there's uh, anything else heavy on your heart. I think I got the heaviest shit out. Yeah, so, yeah, um, but there is much light now. Um, where can people find you? Uh, they can find me on Instagram at worth the fight book. Uh, also on Facebook at worth the fight book. And um, my website is nltrans.org or worth the fight book.org uh, to get more information about what we're up to. And uh, where can people find you, Cal? First of all, how did you get that? What's, what's with the website name? I was, I, I've somehow got to it finally, but I'm like next level transformation. Okay. Is the overarching. And yeah. it's, it's hard to, I wouldn't have been able to pull that out okay. in maybe 10 guesses. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, um, it's nltrans.org. Dot org. You got that folks? Okay. And we'll link to it in the show notes, but for me, uh, the best place, uh, cal.callahan on Instagram is probably where I'm most active. I am on Facebook, but it's, it's not, um, a priority of mine. And then the great unlearn.com is the kind of website that houses some of our stuff. So I say that's probably the best place. Beautiful. Yeah. It's been amazing having this time with you. Thank you for having me yeah. at home. And uh, thank you for welcoming me in these, in this trying time. You know, you, you got a lot of heaviness with, with what's going on in your family. And I, I also want to honor that, that vulnerable share about the, you know, what's alive for you right now and how you're handling this. And uh, your son is, um, is lucky to have a father who's present. And uh, that idea that, that uh, the courage that you showed to be present with, with that, that moment of angst and that really challenging moment where there wasn't a clear it wasn't a clear answer. Um, it's not surprising that the next day, you know, that there was that light that you mentioned and, um, you know, that, 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 that he's, uh, in stronger spirits and embracing this challenging time. And, uh, you know, he's lucky to have two loving parents that are, are here and, and, uh, that this, uh, challenging time can bring your family together. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I, I want to mention that, um, you know, we had set this up a couple, two, three weeks ago. And, um, on Saturday I, I had reached out, I think I had reached out before and I was like, I don't think I'm going to be able to do this. There's a lot going on. I think I may have reached out on Thursday and it was like, it was, I was, you know, it was looking very dire. Um, and you were sweet. You're just like, Hey man, what, whatever you need. And if you want to just get out of the house for a cup of coffee, whatever, like I'm here for you. And I was like, okay, that, that feels really good. And, um, and I said, on Saturday, I got back to you. I said, listen, I'm going to get back to you Sunday afternoon. So I have an idea if we can do this on Monday. And as I shared with you, I woke up Sunday morning and I'm like, I, I need to do this. There's something, you know, there's something calling me to your work. And I had started to get more familiar with um, how you show up and it really resonated for me. And I'm like, there's just such good medicine for me in this conversation. And so I want to acknowledge that, that, that you. you showing up in my life, um, with an open heart and, um, really not knowing me, but saying whatever I needed, um, yeah, that's not lost on me, brother. So thank you so much for, for holding the space for me today and, um, for doing this. Beautifully said. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. All right. <laughs>